Hello, hi, hi. Hi, <laughs> hello, hi. We are like hi Sham. Hi Vikram. Oh, hello, hello YouTube and hello Facebook, which we are simultaneously streaming on because technology. Thank you. Uh, we are live with the homework review of Constitution for episode Five. Episode five. Five. Episode five. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> the episode was on religion though. Yeah, so uh, we are doing a homework review of the episode on religion where we spoke about what are your religious rights, what are our religious rights as derived by the from the constitution and what is secularism exactly and what is the bad, bad word. If I is it not a bad word, please, <laughs> uh, please, it's not a bad word because uh, nowadays whenever you see like people cursing on the internet or on news channel studios, it's more like pseudo secular, secular arties and any other televisions you can I mean, it's a sad commentary that being secular right now is considered a very bad, a very bad word. Why, did, why do you think that happened though? Why, why, why is it, why is it become like this belief that secular is, oh, you are a secular. I, I think much like everything else that happens in public discourse, it's political, <laughs> where uh, you just found, I mean, there is an inherent anxiety that is always there, right? Uh, especially when it comes to India where, I mean, the Hindu, so, for lack of better words, the Hindu faith. Um, <laughs> lack of better words, really. Is, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you, it, is a, it does propagate a deeply fragmented society. Mm. Right, I mean, the caste being the easiest form of how that fragmentation happens. And uh, therein, when you say that, you know, when you use ideas like secularism, which are inherently Western, liberal ideas and you impose it and then you see that the other sort of castes and the upper strata of the Hindu faith, their rights are being curtailed or their sort of whatever privileges that they had and whatever privileges that or whatever rights were denied to the lower caste. The moment that happens and people aren't treated equally, obviously the ruling elite or the prevailing classes, they will um, they will, they, it will, they will, it will have a fight, sort of pushback. And I think secularism becomes one of those phrases where you denied it. But, um, but I mean, it's inherently a, it's meant to just create an equal space. I mean, there's nothing more, nothing less about it. But the backlash against secularism is actually a global thing. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Turkey was set up as a secular republic under uh, Ataturk in 1920s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Turkish people love Ataturk. But then look at the current president Erdogan, who is a religious conservative who is stressing the need for Islam to be, you know, be more dominant in the, the political culture. Hungary, where you know Viktor Orban, a right nationalist guy, and he he is bringing back Christianity to the fold. The rise of the religious right in uh, the U.S. right, and 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 you can see that this rise in religious fundamentalism across the world starts with the 80s. There is a growing anxiety about a loss of community. Once upon a time, religion yeah. was the basis of community and that sort of broke down. And at the same time, you had this sort of movement to bring it back, but in a far more radical form. And uh, I, Actually, if I can run with that a bit, I think one of the basic, I mean, religion is a much abused stuff. I mean, I think between the three of us, one is an atheist, you're agnostic. You're agnostic and I'm at best uh, somebody who does, who yeah. follows certain <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, a very complicated conversation with religion all the time. Um, and I think we, religion it, at its best also gives you the idea, like you were talking about, the idea of community. It, I mean, I, at least uh, I think for anybody who's seen our episode, at one level, none of us really are, are having a go at religion per se, but or a person's faith, I mean religion can and has and does give a lot of people a lot of solace, a lot of peace, and a, a sense of belonging. And at its best, religion is a wonderful thing that allows you to sort of move in this world. But I think that economics also is something that keeps on coming in. Yeah. So you see this rise of right-wing uh, sort of religious identities as sort of economic problems keep on rising. So when you're economically threatened, when your livelihood is threatened, and your very being is again threatened, then you take solace in a tradition and an institution that is, you know, that claims to be 2,000 years old, 3,000 years old, 4,000 years old, or in the case of pastor a few decades old. Yeah. But 
And I think that is the sort of nub of the matter. Um, so these were great opening comments, guys. Thank you for the opening comments because hello again <laughs> to those who are joining us now after this intense opening comment session. Uh, you are watching Constitution Homework Review Live. We are discussing our religion episode. So if you haven't seen it, you can pause this and go and see it. And uh, if you haven't, you can also see it after this live. Yeah. And then follow it up with this live again to give get context. I mean, I have a good authority that is quite well written. <laughs> and uh, we, we're not insulting towards religion. I would agree. Uh, so this is Vikram. And this is Shah. Both of whom all are All of my insulting bits were taken out of the episode. Yeah. So uh, guys, can you also like, talk a little bit about writing this episode? How oh, crazy man. it was? It was <laughs> I, mean, I, I put my faith in God. <laughs> So yeah. this was supposed to have been written over two weeks. Yeah, it went for two months. Yeah, right. And we kept fighting over secularism <laughs> uh, because. Um, Shankar yeah. agreed that I was right and he was wrong. No, I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no way I would agree to that. <laughs> so uh, part of the problem was that when we are right, we are talking about secularism. There are so many different definitions of it. Some of which we explain in the show. Yeah. But then that is just the very tip of the. I suppose the yeah, tops of it. So, um, there's so much more to it and there's so many scholars who have written about it in a western context, in Indian context, even in an Indonesian context if you want to check it out. Uh, so Indonesian context. Yeah. Oh, but uh, yeah, this is a very interesting point we have to talk about this right at the beginning is that the uh, western form of secularism versus Indian form of secularism is different. Right? And he also mentioned this briefly about a western idea becoming a Indian idea over time right through imposition or whatever just acceptance but it's the difference being that uh, in, in the western idea it's a separation of church and state yeah. Yeah. but in India the state can intervene when human rights are concerned like um, Shyam do you want to take this? Yeah. <laughs> so for the longest time and I think even now I am not sure that this distinction between the western and Indian form secularism really holds Right. But our 8th no, I mean, I... grade civics book has exactly this written in it. And the functional assembly debates. Yes. Yeah, but I think that, I, but I don't, I, I also believe that there are no ideas that, especially in today's day and age, that there are no ideas that are truly Western or truly Indian and all of this. I think in each of these uh, concepts, each of these ideas that try and theorize about society, that try and codify society, that try and do all of these, they're so specific to the region that they're in. So even ideas like secularism, while it may have originated in one place, um, the way it moves around, the way it's implemented. So secularism in India can be still defined as secularism, but having its own different forms, as opposed to what's it in France or what's it in so the US or what's yeah. it in uh, sort of England, Germany, in each, each of these spaces. It's not like secularism is like one block even in the Western Correct. European or the Anglo-American world. Correct. Yeah. Look, you just look at France and the UK, right? Word of difference. The French form of secularism, mm -hmm. like it is, it's called, is very, very severe. The mm -hmm. restriction, the kind of separation between the church and state. And the UK, severe so being what? In that there has to be absolutely no connection. Right. Yeah, the, yeah, I mean. There was a time when the French actually abolished Christianity and had their own religion based on the religion. This is during the French Revolution. French Revolution. French Revolution. They, uh, you know, completely revamped their calendar because the current yeah. calendar we form, we follow, the Gregorian calendar. No, the calendar they had was the Brumaire. The Brumaire yeah. and all of those yeah. months which were there. The, yeah, so the uh, Gregorian calendar was actually developed by the Pope, Pope mm -hmm. Gregory the Twelfth. Mm -hmm. So, it's... Interesting. Yeah. Uh, today, guys, by the way, uh, you are watching this live on a very momentous day because uh, Tanika, Tanika is there, who is also a writer by the way, and, but she refused to come on the camera. So, she just sent me this. Uh, Sabrimala board changes stand, supports entry of women of all ages. Yeah, so that happened. Basically, all this while when the Sabrimala board was fighting in court that, you know, our traditions are being violated, etc. Now, they have said that it's fine. Yeah, guys, which, all which this drama, that how it's fine. political is all of this? Yeah. <laughs> because that's the only reason that, I mean, Nothing has changed since yesterday today. Now, I, mean, when, uh, I don't know when the when they went up to the Supreme Court and they filed the petition, which is earlier this year. Mm. And I mean, this is in this when in February, so earlier this year wasn't all that far away. And um, so it only goes to show that something has happened. Elections are coming up. Somebody has spoken to somebody who's spoken to somebody and said, Ki, "Hey, man, this might cause us some female votes. Why don't you just <laughs> be quiet for a bit?" 
I mean, even BHKC did the same with uh, Ramon uh, today. No, but uh, when the judgment had originally come out, RSS supported, saying we, you know, allow, you know, we, uh, we want women to enter Sabha. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we, we. I mean, RSS is a very famous secular organization, as said by Mohan Bhagwat. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> remember, the RSS goal is to create a casteless and classless society in India. So, amazing. Yes. Amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, Shivam Yadav said, uh, asked, what are the limitations to right religion? Right? Uh, Shivam, but uh, also go watch the episode again because we have also mentioned uh, the right, the limitations to the right yes. religion. But there's a very interesting limitation that I think um, we should actually spend some time looking at. Okay, Let me open the article. So it says, Article 25.1 says, subject to public order, morality and health and to the other provisions of this part, all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience, all of that. The interesting thing that I find is to the other provisions of this part. Remember that Article 25 is uh, is an article in Part 3 of our Constitution. Part 3 needs some fundamental rights. Right. Meaning, this article, Article 25, is subject to every other fundamental right that we find in the Constitution. Yeah. If it violates, if our if our religious practice or religious belief violates any of our yeah. fundamental rights, then that our right to religion can be curtailed to the extent that it violates. That's the limitation, basically. It's, it's a mass, but if you look at the Supreme Court, and, and whenever issues about freedom of religion comes to the Supreme Court, it's always because that practice violated a fundamental right. right. The Supreme Court applies this test known as the essential practices test, right. right? which is that basically, is this practice an essential part of the religion? And if it isn't, then you know you can do away with it. How do they decide? Uh, oh, so, so you have judges trained in Indian law who study, you know, religious texts, right? They go through the Quran, they go through the, you know, whatever. All the other and things. they decide what is essential or not. Yes, yes. Oh, so, so for the triple talaq judgment, there were five judges, right? One of whom was Muslim, the other four, one was Christian, there were three Hindus, and they were all going through, you know, and one was, was Sikh as well. Just as care. Yeah, orthodox Sikh, yeah. okay, going through Sharia law to find out whether you know, Tribhutala was really a Muslim, Muslim you know, essential yeah. practice of Muslim or not. Why? And they I ultimately mean? decided it isn't. It isn't, yeah. Like, who are you to, you know, uh, uh, rule on what is or is not part of a religion? You no, just have to know whether... But also, like, the idea of what is an essential part of your religion keeps on changing. Yeah, it is. Like, I mean, I, one of the clearest examples, uh, easiest examples I can give is caste. Hmm. It is... It was viewed as such an, I mean, the idea of ritual purity is viewed as a very integral part of, say, Hinduism, but we we all are in agreement, at least three of us, and I would like to believe a few people that are watching this, um, that caste is a very bad practice. I mean, it is at best distasteful, at worst, it's horrible, terrible, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, religion evolves. I mean, religious practices, how we understand religion, and as society involves, so does religion. Yeah. And you know, so I think that you it's know we should be that an institution that looks at you know precedent and all of that sees that over time you know there's an evolution in law. But suddenly, when it comes to religious practice, what is the oldest authoritative yeah, text that we can look at? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that justifies or does not justify this. No, this, is, this is interesting because uh, with with like for instance Haji Ali or Sabri Mana, where so the exception to religion. And thank you for asking this question. The point is that you know when basic human rights are violated. So the way that this can be looked at when you know women are not allowed to enter a religious structure is that uh, it's discrimination mm. plain old discrimination right based on gender yeah. which is one of the I fundamental mean, rights which we have that we can't be discriminated I mean, some of these religions are quite patriarchal i have not authority <laughs> yeah. I mean, but but you can you can draw a parallel between women uh, wanting to enter these religious uh, structures to uh, you know lower caste uh, you know mm. movements that you know demanded temple entry in the 20s and 30s mm-hmm. during our freedom struggle, right? So, if we accepted that, right, that, that was such a massive thing at that time. We, yeah. we don't know that yeah. sitting now because we don't know the kind of debates or the furor it created when uh, people from lower caste demanded that they be allowed to enter temples. <laughs> and even like our familial memories, like for example, I mean, I can only sp- again speak for myself, which is that growing up, um, like. I am upper caste, so therefore the ideas of restrictions, the, I mean the entire system was geared to sort of people like me, mm. I mean an upper caste ma- uh, male, where, whether it be it you know, dealing with entering temples or any conversation that I had with my faith, it came from that prism. So you know, even as a 
sort of the memories of families that you have, like you know, you hear stories about your grandfather, great grandfather, and so on and so forth. Um, none of these the, these conversations are completely uh, absent. So it's whereas if you talk to somebody, say who's a Dalit, I mean, they'll have a very different conversation and a very different way that they engage with their faith. Yeah. So I think that's a very important thing that where you stand is also uh, sort of your caste, your class, all of these things are very important in how you interrogate faith. So you always listen. If a person has an anxiety about their faith or has a criticism about some faith, I think it's well worth your time to mm -hmm. listen to what they're saying because they'll have definitely have a different perspective from you. Um, uh, so, to the guys who are just joining us, our uh, homework <coughs> question which was asked was that are your religious rights being violated and if yes, give us instances. So, if you have anything to tell us about you know, where you think religious rights are being violated and why they shouldn't be <coughs> etc. Please leave the comments right now which will be sent to me on my phone. I'm looking at comments guys. I'm not, I'm not fubbing. Uh, but uh, there, uh, there are a few questions which I think uh, you will find interesting. So, Inayan asks, is Francis' model of secularism in India better? How do you pronounce this? Laicite. Laicite. Is, so, uh, Inayan asks, is Francis' Laicite a better model for secularism in India? Which means like absolute separation of... No, religion. I mean like for example in France there was a huge, uh, the hijab, contro uh, the right. headscarf controversy then it was about uh, wearing a big cross yeah. and then uh, Sikhs whether they can keep that turban. So, uh, no, I mean, I think in the final analysis these, the idea of secularism is so that you don't discriminate and not that you deny the presence of sort of religious and uh, religion in the public spaces it's mm -hmm. when as a government you don't uh, sort of you don't take sides mm -hmm. yeah. you intervene only when uh, sort of other laws and the injustices are being happening so i think in that respect there is nothing wrong with anybody professing their religion but again it's a question of how uh, like i remember last year when uh, we had a in one of our homework reviews where on Ganesh Chaturthi, Shadesh and I, we had a massive argument wherein um, he said it was all right for Ganesh or something to that show. But again, can there has to be limits to mm. everything, yeah. right? And the moment it's in the public space, if it's in, if it's in your private space, then it's fine. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to religion, I mean, by and large. Yeah. A lot of Ganesh Chaturthi processions are, you know, um, purposely um, mapped but the route is purposely designed to go through Muslim majority, you know, call neighborhoods. I mean, that's one theory. No, it, it is actually true because uh, in Chennai, at least, a lot of the processions have been, you know, diverted by the police because they, you know, they were purposely designed to go through Muslim majority neighborhoods. As one theory goes. <laughs> Allegedly. 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 Yeah, I mean, but I think that, so again, now we're seeing again how religion can be prone to being politicized. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that religion by its very definition, will always be uh, politicized. It but uh, but, but, but this is true. I mean, at a certain level, I'm not saying that everybody who believes in, but there are people who would uh, move. These processions do happen. And that's when religion becomes a tool. Yeah. Rather yeah. than it being a space of celebration and all this. Like, for example, if you read uh, history, uh, the sort of the history books of, especially the United Provinces, which is now Uttar Pradesh, you will see like during Muharram, these Tazias that would go, Hindus and Muslims would go there. You go to any of these Dargas, uh, be it the one in Ajmer or Nizamuddin, the uh, Ajmer, uh, the Ajmer Sharif or the Nizamuddin Darga in Delhi, people of all faiths uh, are welcome. Uh, I mean, there's none of those restrictions that are mm, placed. Yeah. Conversely, mm. if you go to say, places like Sabin Mala, where one gender is, or if you go to say, places like Puri, where, um, there is, there are restrictions, mm -hmm. yeah. and I mean, now again, you can say that this is private, public. So these are again, as what can you as a going by what can you as a state do? Yeah, but but yeah. you know my problem is, um, and this is coming from the question that you asked, um, to have a secular state, right? Is it possible to have a secular state without having secular citizens? And, and, and the reason that's the case is because the way we started this episode is that the rules of society were originally drawn up by religion, right? And today we have yeah. come to move away from it uh, wait, as wait, people. I, I'll just add a question sure. to this, sure. like, because it's related to this. Hafiz asks, are Indian laws theocratic? Interesting. Um, we'll come to that. Yeah. Right? Go on. Um, so, 
given that the reason why I, I believe that it's not possible uh, for you know religious people to accept a secular state is because by definition, if you are religious, you cannot. I mean, you believe in the power of your god, or your gods. Yeah. Right. And and you think that you're they're all powerful. And their supremacy over all exactly. aspects. Their supremacy over all aspects <laughs> of your life is unchallenged. But the moment you accept the constitution and you accept a modern way of life, you have to accept that you know a lot of the kind of lot of realms of human action are actually decided by us, mm -hmm. and that God's will has nothing to do with what we do. A constitution determines how we behave and how we act and how we relate to each other, and not what God says. Can can you as a religious person accept that? Accept the sort of narrowing of the boundaries of your faith to just one small aspect of your life? That's very interesting. Like yes. basically, where uh, for instance, like like to give like a very weird and stupid example is that. Um, as no, I don't say that, like no. As a child, yeah, don't don't no. put yourself down. I mean, don't, don't, be, don't be so honest. I'm going to be Lie. very very stupid now. So, uh, we no, know. Yeah. Now, now you know what we have to deal with. <laughs> Tanika is literally sh shaking her head like going again. So when, when you're as a child, you were growing up and you're in, within that family, basically you're doing like religious practices and pujas, etc, etc. And then as an adult, when you're actually meeting people from different faiths, right? Uh, there is a point in your life where you realize that your faith is not the only one, right? But there are other faiths. And the only way these two can get along is through law. When something is bigger than each of us, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what essentially you're saying that uh, do you want to accept as a religious person whether you know to get along with everyone else? Would you accept the constitution as a larger entity which is controlling that? No, I, I think the see these are the sort of these are issues that I feel are not a thousand years old. I think these are the problems that you have from modern state. Because if you look yeah. at in India, you had uh, different courts for different faiths. You had uh, different courts of sort of social engagement marriages, inheritance, property rights, all of these things. So these are all, so I mean, there was a pre-modern way of dealing with it for the advent of the nation state. But I think with, with the coming of the nation state with certain ideas of laws and certain sense, I mean, the, I think once we all get to that social contract that we want to live in a nation state, you come to these sort of compromises right, and yes. you right. come to these understand things. Because then that's how you as a state will move forward. Right. Do you want to answer the theocratic? Law question. Are Indian laws theocratic? No, I mean, I don't have much to say on that. Right, so, I mean, but, but just as a point, theocracy is actually a system of government. So, it's, it's an entire system of government. So, it, you can't have laws that are theocratic in a democratic system. But I get the spirit of the question. He's asking probably, are laws derived from religious sources or yeah. do they have? In that case, yes, a lot of personal laws in our country are religious, are, are yeah. derived from religious laws. And it's funny because for atheists, really, you can't, you don't really have a lot of scope except for one or two places. Um, but you know, you are if you are an atheist, you're still a Hindu atheist or a Muslim atheist. Or <laughs> atheist. You can't be like an atheist without any adherence to any particular. I mean, religion. but uh, in the uh, census, don't you now? Can't you now write that you're an atheist? Can, but that's just senses. I mean, in, in, in despite no, that, as part of law, as part of law, yeah. right? I, no matter how much I proclaim that I'm an atheist, according to law, I'm still Hindu. Okay, so no, actually, I'm actually, I have a question. Uh, I checked this with my law professor, by the way. I'm just swatting me down, saying. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. When I say I had a question, it wasn't a challenge. Okay. We're not a combative being <laughs> at all. Um, no, so say for example, if I'm an animist, say if I'm, uh, if I'm a part of a, say if I like if I'm part of a tribe in. Uh, some part in Eastern India, where my beliefs are not the same. I don't believe in sort of the Vedas or the Upanishads or the Purans, but I believe in my own sort of regional deity. How would the census, or how would the Indian government, like what would I fill over there? Others? No. If somebody, if somebody knows, uh, please if some, somebody knows, please uh, tweet to Meghna, that he'll tell us. Yes. Uh, so we can take one last question. Sure. We have less time left. So Ashwin is asking Sham. Uh, if triple talaq would have been essentially Islamic, then would it have been banned? Or modernization limits religious rights? This was the test she went on, right? So if, if a religious practice were an essential part of a religion, right? And uh, and then violates the fundamental uh, right, then the court would be in a bind. Yeah. Because then they'd be like, this fundamental right more important, is the essential practice more important. 
And and my argument is why do you even need to get into this mess when the constitution is so clear? If if this Article Twenty Five violates of any other fundamental right, that other fundamental right will always supersede this article. So yes, just a, so why do you want to get into like essential practices? And and why should you know judges who who are trained in secular law, right, try to determine what are the boundaries of religious? You know, uh, bodies of theology or, or religious practice. So, okay, not I, I, that they are, I want to understand. But is, isn't, that a, isn't that a testament to how other institutions have sort of failed over the years? Wherein, instead of uh, dealing with it maybe politically, instead of dealing with it uh, as a society, yeah. your, your only recourse is because all of these other facets of public life have become so toxic and so corrupt. Yeah. And. Uh, which is not a legacy of the Congress solely, <laughs> um, <laughs> that you have no recourse but to go to the judiciary, Correct. which is, I mean, I'm not making no comments on it. One has heard stories about its integrity. And uh, truth, right, rightly or wrongly, I honestly don't know either way, but I, I don't know. Um, that they are the last uh, place that you can go to for any degree of fair, the fairest, sort of outcome, outcome. Yeah. of judgment. Now, whether you obey that judgment is also a question now. Depends, on, the, depends on the elections. I mean, yeah. not, not, I mean on, <laughs> on the elections. That's what I was going to say, not elections. No, but uh, like, I think, you know, it's very really interesting when you, uh, when, when you pointed out that, you know, the judges are sort of defining the boundaries of the religion, what is essential. Yeah. I'm just wondering if they have, like, consultants. <laughs> yes, of course, yeah. of course. I mean, they, they, uh, like basically imams and you know Hindu priests etc they well, come I mean, to that their be part of the entire hearing so for example uh, on both sides would bring their experts judges would uh, experts their, yeah as in uh, and then the judge will uh, then make those calls and he would, they would all have their own clubs they would That's all have interesting. consultations interestingly this is what the British did when they wanted to ban Sati they you wow. know yeah they actually called experts I mean pundits from different denominations different sects and they all had a massive argument about whether sati really constituted an essential practice in, of Hinduism or not. And for some reason, the British government sided with those pundits who said it's not an essential practice. No, Europe. but also it... Uh, mm -hmm. You're getting on a... I mean, to use a cricket metaphor, a very sticky wicket when you're having when you're making that statement. Mm -hmm. Because so much of it was also how uh, sort of the British perceived Indian uh, space. Uh, so, for example, I think Lata Mani has a phenomenal yes, article exactly. where she very famously says that women were neither the object nor the subject of that debate. Yeah. Where she shows and where she sort of argues that Sati wasn't a prevalent practice. Correct. It wasn't a widespread practice, but it was also, but as far as the colonial state was concerned, it sort of conformed with their notion of how best to sort of civilize or bring civilization back to mm. India. I yeah. mean, especially by then, James Mills, the idea that util, uh, so slightly more utilitarian, utilitarian beliefs would come in. Mm. And so, I mean, it was far more political than them just saying that these are what a few priests are saying, and therefore. Okay, okay. And we, and are, we are going into different territories, guys. Yeah, sure. We are going into like many, many. <laughs> now I know why this took us two months. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because Shah does not read that much of history. Yeah. Uh, so, that, that is not going to be MNC. <laughs> That, that is called slander. I'm just a media development space. <laughs> okay, uh, we have to unfortunately end it now, but uh, we have... So, uh, Tanika just messaged me saying, Triple H is saying that I'm running away from his question. You didn't send me his questions. What is his question? His questions are directed to Congress and not you guys. Oh, but no. <laughs> send the question. Send, send one question. <laughs> I mean, it is, he is the game. Yeah. So, uh, so okay. So, Triple H, uh, I'm getting a filtered questions thing, okay, on WhatsApp. So, Tanika is the one who is like sending questions that she's genuinely. Because Tanika genuinely is the most knowledgeable of all of us. <laughs> I'm like, really you know, excited. Which is most excited. This is the one life that she's here. That's why whenever we're saying something that we think might be silly, we're looking towards her. Okay. And she's so, reassuringly saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here is, here is Triple H's question. Mamta Banerjee, cabinet minister, once took took down journalists to a city, took down journalists to a city in West Bengal and said, this is mini Pakistan, he is still a minister. Is that secularism? I mean, is that even accurate? I, I'm not I mean, like, uh, no, no, so Triple H, I, I think it's very important that whenever, um, like, WhatsApp forwards aren't the best resource, especially when we were researching our episodes, that's what we realized is that we put off our WhatsApp. That uh, that's not the best way yeah. to do this. 
But no, I mean, that, that has nothing to do with secularism because I think what you're getting into the realm of is nationalism. And I think uh, that's a completely different topic. Yeah, but if we're going to end, let's talk about how the reason why secularism is such an abused term today in our political discourse is also because it has been abused by political parties for all sorts of things. Absolutely. Right? And uh, uh, Triple H, I would uh, genuinely give you an answer to this. Uh, is that secularism does not make sense after the sentence you just gave us? Which is, you narrated an incident where some minister took a journalist to one part in West Bengal and said this is mini Pakistan and you are asking basically is this secularism so no it is not I because mean, that is not what secularism is about I mean, I mean seriously uh, I because mean, what would he I, I mean you would have to think what is this ministry even thinking uh, yeah it, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a weird it's a very incident. fun yeah. story yeah um, so his second question is if congress comes to power after that will muslims accept UCC uniform civil code we have been um, we've not really touched on, touched on civil uniform, code because yeah. and I think that's for one very important reason is that something that we want to talk about far more in depth not just throw it away yeah. and in, as a throw away sentence in a larger conversation about secularism because we also felt that uh, secularism as a concept requires so much of a discussion, so much of debate and so much of an understanding that uh, to put Uniform Civil Code as a s small chunk in that would be dis doing disservice to 